Thanks for that. Alice is going to be inside that for the rest of the day. Uh, the first person that we're going to be introducing is Dr. Becky Smethurst. Um, she's from the University of Oxford. So perhaps we can bring her in and have a little chat with her um, about what she's going to be talking about with her panel. Are you there, Becky? Yeah, hi, Susie. How can you? Hi, great, Becky. Great. Nice to see you. So I'm you um, showing my allegiance. I know that it's Mars Day today, but I've, Saturn's my favourite. So I've got a beautiful uh -oh. background of Saturn. Uh -oh. to <laughs> That's OK. I'm, I'm cheering for Mercury, so it's all right. Um, sure. Well, welcome. Thank you so much for, for being part of, of our Mars Day here. I wonder if you could just sort of introduce yourself a little bit uh, and maybe a little intro to your research, Becky. Yeah, sure. Um, so my name is Dr. Becky Tethers. I am an astrophysicist at the University of Oxford. So I am the type of scientist that essentially asks questions that we don't yet know the answer to about the universe. And my specific specialty is supermassive black holes. And in particular, how black holes grow, which people often get weirded out by when I say that, because they're like, aren't black holes just endless hoovers sucking everything and anything up? That's how I imagine it. That's how, but like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So well, many so people think of it like that, but they're, they're the furthest thing from hoovers you could possibly imagine, right? I actually like to say they're more like couch cushions, right? Because you know your couch is just sat there in your living room, very unassuming. It's not dragging anything towards it. It's not sucking <laughs> anything in. But if you lose something down the side of your couch cushions, it's gone for good, right? And it's the same thing with black holes. So actually getting stuff towards a black hole is really, really difficult because space is just so big you won't believe how mind-bogglingly big space is you know Douglas Adams style and so uh, there's lots of different processes that we've had to think about for a long time about how we get stuff down to a black hole in the first place and one way we thought was was two galaxies merging these huge collisions of these galaxies islands of billions of stars um, and actually my research has shown that's probably not the case but then we don't know what it is then if it's not mergers. So yeah, still working Great on it. open questions. That's what we like. Questions no one knows uh, the answer I've got to. so it's many questions kind of about black holes yeah. I don't understand. Rather than let Dallas interview you for the next 40 minutes yes. asking about black <laughs> holes, we're going to hand over to you and the rest of your panel to have a little mm -hmm. discussion um, about your careers and perhaps careers in your area more generally. So Becky, over to you. Great. Thank you, Susie. Thanks, Dallas. Yes, welcome to this session on science in space for Mars Day 2022. We are four scientists working to better understand our space, and we'll hear from each of them very soon. We have Dr. Peter Grindrod, who's a research leader uh, in planetary science at the Natural History Museum. We have Dr. Gabrielle Hodoson, who is an astronomer turned software engineer as well for the um the square kilometer array radio telescope and we also have dr louisa preston who's an astrobiologist and planetary geologist from UL as well i'm your host i've just introduced myself i'm dr becky smellis astrophysicist at oxford studying supermassive black holes but i also love to just chat space and update people on space news on youtube as well you know on the side of all this research i do on black holes as well we're going to be talking to you not just about what we do and what our days look like as scientists and researchers but also how we get to where we are today as well sort of you know if you're a student perhaps at school or at university now you know how do we get from there to actually doing science and doing research so for me, I mean, everyone will have a completely different path. Uh, my path looks like um, I was at school doing my A-levels. I did physics, maths, further maths and chemistry, mainly because they were my favourite subjects, which is why I chose them. And then I went on to university to do a degree in physics with astronomy. And that was at Durham University. It was a four year course. One of these things is called undergraduate masters. And then from there, I went on to the University of Oxford to do a PhD in astrophysics and a PhD is essentially the degree that you do to learn how to become an independent scientist to learn what questions still need answering that we don't know the answer to but most importantly how you even go about answering those kind of questions how do you answer questions like how do supermassive black holes go that's what you learn to do in a PhD and you learn to think for yourself and decide what's important and what should we look at it's also the degree that you get and then you get to call yourself doctor as well so you'll see all of our panelists today have um, got that had the joy of being able to change your bank cards from miss or mister to doctor as well I think that was a very exciting day um when that happened so uh, we've already heard a little bit about my research on 
black holes. So let's head over to one of our other panelists as well. Uh, Louisa, can we start with you? Dr. Louisa Preston, who is a lecturer in planetary science at UCL. Louisa, first of all, can you tell us about what do you do? What's, what's your research on? What's your science questions you're answering? So I am a geologist by training, although have a love for biology. I always say I'm a geologist by training and astrobiologist by choice. So what I do is I study rocks on the earth um, as analogues, so rocks that can mimic or look a lot like rocks we find on other planets and on other moons. On earth, we are lucky, we are surrounded with water, we have life everywhere, and life when it dies, which is a bit depressing, does like to get trapped and buried inside rocks and minerals, and it can get preserved for millions or even billions of years. And we know that by looking at the rocks on the earth, that all this life can get trapped and stuck, we know that we can find it, we can test different types of instruments to analyze it. And then we realize that actually a lot of the rocks on the earth and a lot of the processes on the earth look a lot like what's going on on say Mars or the moon or maybe even the icy moons of Jupiter and Saturn. And so I can take all the stuff I study on the earth and then apply it to other planets. And so at the moment I'm working on Mars, looking for whether we can find what we call biosignatures. So signatures of biology, hidden uh, in the rocks on Mars. Yeah, we actually had a question before um, from someone from Nagara Sofian who said, um, is, well, they asked if any astronauts reach Mars and is there life on Mars as well? Um, I know, it's such a good I question. No. <laughs> <laughs> I know, no astronauts have reached Mars yet. Um, it takes, best case scenario, seven months uh, to get to Mars. Um, and in that time, it's a pretty brutal journey. It's a very, very tiny spaceship and there's lots of radiation and lots of risk. So, so far, no humans have gone. We've sent our trusty robot explorers to go who can handle the space environment a lot better than we can. We're planning it though. Humans will go eventually. We just have to figure out a good reason for why other than we just kind of want to go. And is there life on there? Well, I'll put that question out to everyone else as well. I think it half the time it comes down to actually belief. I believe that the Earth could not be the only place that life has originated. It might be that life originated on Mars and then went extinct. It might be that it was there for a little bit longer and then the environment on Mars changed and it got much more colder and inhospitable and now it's hiding under the surface or maybe it wasn't there at all. I think there's evidence for it under the surface. We just have to get underneath and have a look. Yeah, that's what we're hoping all these rovers will find as well, won't we? So can you yes. talk us through, Louisa, what does a typical day look like for you as someone who studies Mars? You know, I think it's as, as a student, it's very difficult to think, what would I actually be doing? I know. I think I always think it's quite a disappointing answer. My typical day is probably like everybody else's. It's checking emails, go to work, procrastinate on social media, <laughs> do, do all the things that everybody else does. Um on, the, on fun days, I get to go into the lab. So we run a lot of experiments. We have a lot of instruments where we're breaking rocks apart. We're putting them into things called spectrometers, which shines infrared light onto the rocks and it makes all the um, molecules inside vibrate. And that can tell us the composition of the rocks and whether there's bugs inside them, which is really interesting. And then I say on my best days, I get to go into the field. So I get to go and do field work in analog environments so environments across the earth that mimic those on I'll say Mars for an example here so a lot of my field work involves going to look at volcanoes and hot springs in Iceland or looking at looking underneath the ice in Antarctica and looking at rocks there or hot springs in New Zealand or salt pans in Spain you know there's loads of places on the earth that mimic Mars and I say my best days are when I get to be out doing that <laughs> Nice. Yeah. You're almost rivaling us astronomers who use telescope who get to travel to Hawaii and Chile and South Africa. I think <laughs> yeah. volcanoes and hot springs in Antarctica sounds incredible. What but like incredible like opportunities to travel as well. Yes. When you're not traveling though, you're in the lab and you're at your desk. What are you physically doing sort of on, you know, on, on your computer, like in terms of how are you analyzing experiments? What do you do to get the word out? That kind of stuff. I mean, obviously we're we're researching a lot. So obviously it's a massive community of people who are all working together to do different bits. So from our side, you know, we take our rocks, we take them into the lab, we try and break down what's actually inside them. So what minerals we're looking at, what kind of organisms are inside them. And we try and figure out how the organisms got there, were particular minerals better at preserving them or not. And then we publish it. We have to write about all the different things that we're doing 
to we do it in academic journals, but we also do it in popular science magazines. You know, we're not particularly fussy. We want everyone to know what we're doing, <laughs> as many yeah. people as possible. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I'd say it's a really um, it's a really scientific job, but it's a really creative job. I spend so much time telling stories um, mm. and finding the best ways to talk about our science that's interesting and understandable instead of just lots of wiggly lines and graphs and spectra and stuff. Yeah, I don't think I realised as a student how much writing was involved in being a scientist because it's so important to be able to do that communication side of things. Exactly. And can you tell us how did you how did you get from sort of school to where you are now? Just mm. to give people an idea of the path they would walk if they want to play around with things that look a little bit like Mars as well. Well, I mean, I think my path is very, um, I wouldn't say I'm a stereotypical scientist. Um, I... I'll, I'll admit I don't like maths and I didn't like maths very much and I wasn't very good at it not even great at physics if I'm honest I was so much more interested in geography mm. and history and biology so I wanted to know how the earth worked and how life came to be and the history of everything and that's really what fascinated me um, and particularly volcanoes who doesn't love a volcano um, and so that's kind of what led me to go to university and study geology I, I wanted to learn more about the earth and it was only once I started to do a degree in geology, I went to Imperial College in London, um, that it was only there that I realised that geology was universal. It, it was on every planet and on every moon. And actually, I didn't have to always constrain myself with the earth. Mm. I could just look wherever I wanted to. Um, and then obviously, like you, decide to do a PhD. Um, and I, you know, I was just cheeky with my PhD. I basically created my own project, mixing together everything that I loved. So I did space volcanoes and life, and I just moshed it, <laughs> moshed it all together and uh, found a way to just work on that for three years. That's and, amazing. Yeah. And I've been working in, we call that area astrobiology ever since. Astrobiology, it's definitely cool, isn't it? Sort of like the life elsewhere, I guess, is all, like how it's even yeah. possible to get life elsewhere. It's I not guess that's horoscopes. That, <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's one question I can ask you then. Where do you think is the most likely place after Earth that we might find evidence of life? I'd say Mars. Um, I think Mars has got such a history that mimics our own. We mm -hmm. recognise our planet in Mars. Um, and so we have seen evidence the water used to flow across the surface. We know there's ice under there now. We know it once had active volcanoes and lots of processes that would have provided heat and energy. All, and we now know that there's actually carbon there. So all the ingredients for life were there. We just haven't quite found whether they were all put together. Yeah. And then I think obviously from a lazy person's point of view, it's near us. It does make it easier to study yeah. the world that is quite near us and that we can see quite easily <laughs> through telescopes yeah. and get to. So my money's on Mars, although I think under the ice of Europa could be very exciting as well. Yeah, I was going to say, I think my I, I think Mars is more likely, but I'm secretly hoping that it's around Saturn's moon. So yeah, me too. Because <laughs> then we get an excuse to go back to Saturn. Saturn's my favourite. <laughs> Thank you Absolutely. so much, Louisa. That was no great. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions for you later on. So start thinking, all of you who are watching, for questions for Louisa as well. And we'll come back to you in a little bit. But now should we chat to Dr. Peter Grindrod next, um, who is a planetary science uh, scientist at the Natural History Museum. Peter, why don't you start us off with the same question I put to Louisa? Why don't you describe what do you do? What, what's your focus as a scientist? OK, so I work at the Natural History Museum in London, and not everybody knows that as well as going along to look at the dinosaurs, there's actually behind the scenes in the basement there's about 300 scientists that work on looking at the collections in the museum and answering some kind of really important questions about the Earth, but also the other planets as well. So that's not very well known that the museum has this amazing meteorite collection, one of the best in the world. And so there's a group of researchers there that are devoted to basically studying the solar system and the other planets and trying to figure out how the solar system formed, how it's evolved, how it's changed, and also comparing it to the Earth as well and seeing how it's different. And so I fit into that group by basically looking at the surfaces of other planets and just trying to figure out what's gone on. So what can we see on the, on the surface, either with satellites going around those planets or asteroids or planetary bodies? Um, and that's kind of a field called remote sensing. And that's what I spend most of my time doing. But we also send rovers and landers down to the surface of these other planetary bodies. And so I spend most of my time 
at the moment studying Mars, like Louisa. But I can't say that it was a, a straight and easy path to get to Mars. Um, I started out studying Venus, and I reckon that I've got the claim to fame, maybe, I think I'm pretty sure about this, of being the last person in the UK to actually do a PhD about Venus. And I think that might change soon. I think more people might start again soon. But yeah, scientific interest kind of drifted away from Venus to everywhere else in the solar system. I think I might have been the last, and it was a long time ago. Um, and then after that, I studied uh, the icy moons of the gas giants, looking mostly at how the internal structure changed and evolved and the, the way that heat is lost and whether you can get oceans underneath these giant kind of icy bodies. And then I kind of came back to Mars and also the moon as well. So some days I've been looking at images of Mars and some on one of the, uh, the missions called the Trace Gas Orbiter. It's this ESA mission, mm. European Space Agency. And we were on the camera team for that. And part of the job, which is amazing, is that we'll kind of do um, a shift as targeting leads. We'll choose where that camera takes photographs of the surface from orbit, from mm. the satellite. And it's this color camera. And the most amazing thing is that you can basically tell the engineers in charge of that spacecraft to point a certain way and take an image of what you want on the surface of Mars. And you, you'll kind of get the images back, not straight away, they'll kind of be taken and stored and then transmitted back when the kind of the data allows. But you know, when you look at that image, you know that you may well be the first person ever mm. to look at that part of Mars, which is just, it still blows my mind and it's still amazing. Um, but I also study the moon as well. And so that's kind of interesting. We, um, we've got a project going on at the moment where we are looking at the Apollo 17 landing site. Mm. And we are using- Not the first humans to see that though. <laughs> no, we're not, no. Although we did work with um, one of the astronauts that went there. We still work with Harrison Schmidt on that. Mm. Um, but you know, the, the sample tube that um, was collected at the time has been sealed and stored perfectly in a pristine mm. condition until just a couple of years ago and they opened it for the first time and so we're part of that effort to actually learn kind of new things from the moon using instruments that you know are much much better than they were in the 1970s early 70s mm. kind of 50 years of evolution of laboratory instruments so so yeah I work on a lot of different planetary bodies but I guess the overall aim is to just figure out why they look the way they do yeah, I mean, you've had a real tour of the solar system there, haven't you? Yeah. Like your career. In fact, there's a great question coming from someone who asks, when did the planets form? Which I guess by studying all of them, you kind of get an idea for the entire solar system's history, don't you? Yeah, so we, we know from kind of models of the solar system, also samples of asteroids are some of the best samples to get for this. So uh, meteorites usually, so we've got asteroids, um, pieces from meteorites, but also from sample return missions. And so... All the planets formed at about the same time, about four and a half billion years ago. And that's kind of the formation of the solar system. It probably started out as, as this cloud of gas and dust that started to rotate. And then slowly those particles joined together through this process called accretion. And then bigger and bigger bodies started to grow. Some of them would have been knocked apart as they kind of collided. Some of them stuck together. And then there are different models about how the planets form, but we've got the kind of inner planets, the terrestrial planets, they're smaller and rockier. And you go out, you get the, the gas giants, and then you get the ice giants further out as well. And that makes it a really kind of straightforward process and sounds really easy. And, but there's a lot going on to get to that point. You know, and it's amazing that people will study, you know, a single sample and within there, there'll actually be pieces of, um, that kind of predate the formation of the solar system. So older than four and a half billion years or almost the entire sample is older than the Earth because these are the building blocks that made up Earth as well. And so if you come to the museum, you'll see those sorts of samples in the, in the meteorites we've got. Yeah, the oldest rocks, <laughs> not yeah. just on Earth, but in the solar system, right, as well. So what does a typical day look like for you? Because obviously, um, unlike Louisa, you're not going to be going into the field, I guess, if you're working with satellite imagery. So what does, you know, when you're sat at your desk, what are you actually doing? On a good day, uh, <laughs> looking at pictures, and yeah. it's amazing. So um, so when you do like remote sensing, you look at these satellite images and other data as well. We'll go to um, different wavelengths and electromagnetic spectrum. So we might go to, say, uh, near-infrared wavelengths if we want to learn about the composition or mm -hmm. the chemistry of the surface. Combine that with visible wavelength photographs or images, basically. 
And the technology now is amazing. And some of these images are huge. You know, they're kind of like one or two gigabytes just for a single image of a tiny, tiny area of Mars. Mm. I mean, you're dealing with loads of these images. Basically, we'll spend our day on some amazing gaming PCs. You know, the, <laughs> the best computers we can use are these 3D monsters that use for gaming and we use them for processing 3D data and imaging data. So we'll look at these images and we'll try and figure out what happened. And so we might do something like sit around as a group and just look at an area and talk about how it formed. Brainstorm or, almost, yeah. Yeah. Um, or we might be doing something with the, the collection. So we've had PhD students that are still going now that will um, work with the curators of the museum and they'll pull out. So one of the students, Sara, I think he's talking today, um, pulled out all the Mars meteorites that we've got in the museum. And then she pointed uh, a camera, which is going to go on a rover to Mars, we hope. And so she was figuring out how best to use that camera to look at Mars samples, basically, for when it's on Mars. So understanding how the camera works with those kind of types of rocks and compositions and things like that. And so that's in the lab and, you know, long days processing image data and things like that. And occasionally, not as often as Louisa, I'm afraid, but occasionally I might get to go out, you know, into the wild, into the field, go to Iceland or somewhere, do some field work. But it's very focused for what I do on kind of the instruments and how you might do a mission rather than looking at the rocks themselves. Because, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a semi-geologist. It wasn't really a, a straightforward path for me compared to Louisa. I kind of picked up the geology along the way. Mm -hmm. rather than being a, an out and out geologist I think it's something that I slowly warm to I'd say <laughs> rather than you know wanting to do it I was never a fossil collector as a child <laughs> sure. like you get it on the job almost yeah <laughs> yeah all right thanks so much Peter so next up let's chat last but not least I guess we'll chat to uh Dr Gabriella Horasan, who is an astronomer turned software engineer for the Square Kilometre Array radio telescope so Gabrielle this sounds so so interesting please first of all can you tell us what do you do like what's your science focus sure uh, well okay so I don't really have a science focus at the moment because I work as a software developer mm -hmm. uh, I used to be a scientist so I can tell you about that in a bit as well just let me quickly explain what the square kilometer area is in case yeah. people don't really know what we are talking about so that as you mentioned is going to be a radio telescope actually it's going to be two there will be two radio telescopes under the same under the same observatory, and they will be located in South Africa and Western Australia. Uh, they are at the moment being built, and I'm working on the software side of things. I'm working on the very important component, which is going to process the data. So it will make sure that whatever data the telescopes gather will be usable for the astronomers who want to work with it. Um, and, and it's supposed to be finished by the end of this decade. So it's exciting also because this is going to be the world's largest radio telescope. So it's a kind of instrument we've never had before, which means we will gather the kind of data we've never seen before. Mm -hmm. And the idea is that you could learn more about the beginnings of time, how did the first stars, the first galaxies form. Uh, also, some of you might have heard of gravitational waves, which was a big thing recently, and it still is. But to detect those, you would need a specialized instrument. But SKA, the way we shorten it, square kilometer array, will be so powerful that we could detect uh, um, indirectly uh, these waves. So how gravitationally big objects like black, uh, black holes or neutron stars um, uh, interact with each other. So this is another thing. And of course, yeah, we're very ideas. excited about the yeah. astrophysicist because, like, basically, you're almost writing the computer programs that will allow us to actually record this data and analyze this data and get it in the format that I need to to do science. Really, yeah, exactly. Can you explain a bit more about what a radio telescope is because I think people hear radio and they think of sound, right? And they think of sound waves so, from okay. your radio in your car, right? <laughs> so radio, it, it, radio wave is just part of the electromagnetic spectrum. So like visible light, what we see with our eyes, it's also there just a bit on the other side, further away in this long spectrum, which you might have seen. I don't have an image of it, but... Yeah, they're um, really long waves of light. Yeah, right? exactly. So they are very long waves. 
and uh, they are produced by all sorts of things. For example, on Earth, lightning produces radio waves. So my PhD project was actually about lightning, and it was very exciting because it produces so many different kind of waves, including radio. And you can detect these waves uh, just like you would look at uh, Mars with an optical telescope. You can see things. You can also look at the radio source, the radio telescope. You can't see it, but the telescope will be able to detect this signature. And if you process the data, you will get an image, just like you would with an optical telescope. And basically what I do and my team and other teams, we are writing the program, which makes sure that this incoming signal that the telescope detects is usable for astronomers, that they can create their images and that they can analyze these images and, and find very interesting and exciting things on them. Yeah, that sounds great. So what does a typical day look like for you as a, a software engineer? I presume it's lots and lots of computer code, right? Writing in the language yes. that computers can understand. Yes, exactly. So, um, I mean, it's exciting for me. Some might think it's less exciting. I spend most of my day in front of a laptop. <laughs> and yes, but it's not just about writing the code. It's about, it's thinking about it um, what you want the code to do, how you want to do it, what kind of what amount of data it will have to analyze, for example, because it's it's not the same whether it's a couple of megabytes of data or terabytes worth of data every second, which is which is what the SK will do. Um, so you have to sit down, you have to kind of plan what you want to do, and that's also part of the job. And uh, then you write your little code, you make sure it's running. If you find bugs, you fix the bugs, and it's kind of exciting because. <laughs> You see it working and um, you see, I, I also run simulations. So when, you're, when your simulation works, you see what the results are. You see these pretty plots <laughs> and nice pictures. And then you know what you're doing is working and it will do uh, great in the future as well. And then we iterate on it. We make it better. Uh, we make sure that new requirements or if, if something changes, let's say um, astronomers now want to... Uh, see other parts of the universe then maybe your code needs to change then you have to change it yeah um, so you must have to know so much though about what astronomers want how the telescope works how the engineering of it works so that's such a unique combination of um knowledge that you have so how did you get from sort of school to where you are now with all of these understanding of how this all works I've always been interested in a lot of things actually. So when I was a kid, I, I always knew that I wanted to be either an astronomer or an archeologist. So it's, and the thing is, I always loved maths. I, I was not so keen on physics and I ended up being an astronomer, but um, uh, so I studied all sorts of different kinds of subjects and I was interested in them, but I never really decided until really the very end what I wanted to do. And at university, I did earth sciences. So actually, I do have a bit of geology and meteorology background <laughs> as well. But it was a kind of degree where you could learn a lot of different things, so including astronomy, and I, that's what I chose. Um, so I was more focused on the planetary science of things. And my PhD project was about exoplanets and their atmospheres, so planets orbiting other stars outside our solar system. Um, and during this, this past, during my studies, I also learned to program because it's very important for astronomers to be able to write our own code, to analyze our own data. Uh, but after my PhD, I ended up working at a totally different field. I worked as a software engineer for a fintech company. So it was a finance and technology company. Finance, not very exciting, at least not for me. <laughs> But the, the programming side of things was really interesting and how to run it, for example, in the cloud, what kind of infrastructure you need to build. These things turned out to be pretty cool for me. Mm. And uh, then I saw a job at Word and ended up being a software developer for the world's largest radio telescope, which is pretty cool because I managed to combine my two passions. So Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Nice. It shows you that paths aren't always a straight line, right, as well. And especially, exactly. I, I liked what you said, how you decided very late. I think all of us do that. We put off the big decisions, right? <laughs> <So>. <laughs> it, just, it just happens. I knew roughly what I like, and then I, I ended up where I, I need to be, I think. So. Great. Thanks, Gabriella. Okay, I am now going to um, start looking at some of the questions that are coming in as well um, from all of you, which are fantastic. Thank you so much. I'm going to put them to the panel now. 
Um, let's start with this one, because I think this is one for everybody. And let's make it quick fire as well. So let's start with Louisa. Louisa, if you could decide to live on any planet, what would it be and why? Um, I live on Mars because um, although it seems quite hostile, it's probably the easiest place to go. We have we have enough air that we could create from the carbon dioxide atmosphere. There is gravity. There is frozen water under the surface. We've got lots of rocks. We've got good potential soils that we could grow stuff in. Yeah, I think I'd go to Mars. Nice. Peter? Earth. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> no explanation needed. Uh. <laughs> it's completely unique and right. it's precious. And yeah, I'll stay here. Thanks. Nice. Gabriella? <laughs> I was going to say Earth as well because I really like the climate and the and the air quality is pretty good compared <laughs> to other planets. I love but, how you... Oh, go ahead. I would visit Titan, which is not the planet, but the mo uh, moon of Mars... Oh, I'm sorry, Saturn. Um, I just thought it would be really cool to see what, what's like an, uh, a planet which is very similar in some sense to Earth, but from very diff made up of very different chemicals, the atmosphere and the, and the lakes are very different. But I would visit it. I wouldn't want to leave there, though. <laughs> that's exactly what I was going to say was I'd pick a moon of Saturn just because I think the view of Saturn would be amazing <laughs> I'm just going for the view this is the person who picks the airplane window seat every time on an airplane so that doesn't surprise me <laughs> all right um this was a really good question um that I think Louisa is probably a good one for you mm -hmm. um I think it's about Mars what is under all the Mars dust like why is the ground red? And someone has yeah. also asked, like, can you sell Mars dust? I obviously think they're thinking about how you're going to fund your <laughs> research going forward. Um, yeah, so one of my favorite facts is that um, Mars isn't actually red, even though we call it the red planet. It's red on the surface because the dust on the surface is effectively rusting. It's full of iron oxide and that's in relation to the atmosphere, it's turning red. If you go under the surface, even a little bit, the rocks are grey. They look exactly the same as the rocks do on the Earth. And they're actually made of the same thing as Earth rocks. They're all volcanic, just like you find in Iceland or Hawaii or something like that. Um, what was the next part of the question? Uh, with, could you ever sell Mars dust? <laughs> oh, I don't know. I mean, we haven't got a sample of Mars dust yet. So the first person who gets it, if uh, they want to sell it, they could probably make quite a bit of money from it. But at the end of the day, it is just rusty dirt mm, as well. Yeah, which you can find... <laughs> here as well right you can but, find yeah. here as well <laughs> sure um peter i think this is a good question for you so miss murray and her class have asked will any other planets eventually get rings so like saturn's rings they could do um so we think that saturn's rings are a broken up kind of small body mm -hmm. that was like probably orbiting saturn as well so basically a kind of a moon Mm -hmm. And the rings don't last long on the scale of the solar system either. You know, they're not talking billions of years. We're probably talking millions of years. And so the planets have probably had ring systems come and go. And finding evidence of that is quite hard. Mm -hmm. um, so you think about the planets in the solar system. They've got moons. Mercury doesn't. Venus doesn't. The Earth does. I'd rather not have uh, that breakup. Um, Mars has two small moons. And one of those could possibly crash into the surface eventually. And there are actually um, at least one, maybe two impact craters on Mars that are really um, long. Usually they're circular, mm. but it's really long and stretched out. And so one of the ideas for that is that actually that was a moon that crashed into the surface. And before that, it may well have been a small series of rings as well. So it broke up as it got too close because of the gravity. Mm. But yeah, they, the other planets could have rings. Uranus but, um, does, we're right? We're not sure when. Uranus has some really thin ones. They look really cool. Yeah, there are some other ones, yeah. Yeah, I love Uranus, so it spins on its side, it's awesome. Anyway, uh, <laughs> I like this question from JD. Um, I'm going to take this one. If you can choose your job again, what would you be? Um, I don't know if I speak for everyone, but I think I'd always stick with being a scientist, but hearing everyone going on field work and everything, I think I would be a marine biologist because then I get to go to places like the Caribbean and, you know, tropical islands and swim with dolphins. And why didn't I do this? <laughs> I have to sit in a cold telescope dome instead, looking at the sky wrapped up. I could be somewhere lovely and warm. Um, Gabriella, I liked this question from Miss Baxter in her class. Would you get Wi-Fi on Mars? Well, <laughs> probably not like that. Uh, I'm sure you could you could build it out. Um, uh, yeah, so we don't have the infrastructure right, but I love the idea that um, rate the the algorithms that Wi-Fi uses to strengthen our signals. It's the same stuff that radio telescopes use, right? Yeah, I think you're right. 
yeah yeah so like so you, i mean you can always build these kind of things um getting the radio signals around the planet would be much harder though than on earth um yeah. because you they... need the earth ionosphere which i i don't think mars has or it's very patchy mm-hmm. if it has at all um so the radio signals would not really easily travel at least not in the air from one place right. to so you get just too much interference from like the sun, essentially just bombarding yeah. the planet. Yeah. Oh, no Wi-Fi on Mars. Does that change where you'd go, Louisa? Or do you think you still find going to Mars? <laughs> no, I think, I think the main thing to remember is, is that everything we have on the Earth, if you wanted to live on Mars, you just have to start again. You just right. have to start again from scratch. So I'm sure in theory we could have a Mars Wi-Fi. But it wouldn't extend from here. So you'd have no. to start again. <laughs> well, while we're on that uh, topic of starting again and, and thinking about life on Earth. So Riders Green Primary School have asked what creature, which I'm presuming they mean like a, an Earth creature that we know exists, would actually be able to survive on Mars now? They said it would actually help in their STEM activity and trying to design a creature that could survive on the planet. If you could help them out. Oh, my goodness. That's brilliant. Um, there's not really much Earth life that mm. could survive on Mars. There's one organism that we call, it's a little superhero, it's called a tardigrade or mm. a water bear. It's well known for being able to survive the harshest environments. It's gone up in the vacuum of space. If, if I had to put money on a creature that we know of, um, I'd definitely say that the tardigrade would be a good, a good Mars inhabitant. <laughs> so weird, but I think they're really cute. These they're little, so cute. Like microbes, aren't they? They just, they look also like the mammy of microbes. I always think I think what's so great about them is that they they look really alien they look really weird and they can survive all these crazy things but they they also live in your garden and you can go and get moss out of your garden and put it under a microscope in your classroom and you can find the tardigrades and they're there as well so Mm, yeah. yeah um Peter um N Badley's class have asked some of their pupils would like to know what's older than the sun or planets and how would you know that something was older than the sun or the planets? That's sorry, from Whitworth Community High School. Uh, so the sun and the planets are all about the same age. They all mm-hmm. formed at the same time from the same big disk of, of gas and dust. Um, it just happened that the sun got very big and started to kind of give off heat through nuclear reactions and the planets kind of are further away. Um, how do you get samples? We can get samples from... Uh, other planets or asteroids from things coming to the earth so meteorites Uh, we can't collect physical samples of the sun because it's not a a solid thing but you know we we do collect things like the solar wind is kind of um we can kind of or particles sorry or we can detect those things um and we kind of work out the burp isn't it it just sort of occasionally just goes a little bit of uh (laughs) yeah and we sometimes get affected by that kind of thing on the earth like with um uh, aurora northern lights mm-hmm. and things like that um but yeah it's a hard thing to collect samples from but um i think finally it all comes together the samples and the ages through kind of modeling computer models of how how they think these things formed and how long ago they formed as well so they all formed about the same time in our solar system that isn't true of other solar systems like in exoplanets mm. that may well have formed at different times around different stars Great, thank you. And I think we've got time for one more question. And I am so happy because Annie in year nine at Blaken High School has asked a black hole question. <laughs> and she has asked, has anyone ever been sucked into a black hole? And Annie, as far as we know, nobody has. We've watched gas clouds get a little bit too close to black holes before, but this process where stuff falls into a black hole has a very cool physics word to describe it. And it is spaghettification and it's my favorite word possibly ever (laughs) and essentially it's because the gravity if you fall into a black hole feet first the gravity at your feet would be so much stronger at your head that you get stretched out like spaghetti into just a long chain of atoms all the way down to the black hole and it sounds terrifying but it also is just the best word ever to say i dare you all to try and say it without smiling spaghettification (laughs) And I think that's a really nice uh, place to end on as well. So thank you all, uh, first of all, to the panel, to Louisa and to Peter and to Gabriella for sharing with everybody what you do, what your days are like and how you got to where you are now. And thank you to all of you for for joining us as well and for watching. So, uh, yeah, we'll say goodbye and, and hand back, I think, to the Mars Day team.